I'm Paula Fairfield. I'm a sound designer, um, independent, um, and among other things, I've been the sound designer in Game of Thrones since season three. Well, my background is actually as an artist. I went to art school, and um, I did not go to film school. I did not go to recording school. I, there was no sound or film program at the school I went to. It was a, a Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, and at the time, one of the most radical art schools in the world. So I got a schooling in all kinds of things, but none of it sound. However, as my summer job, uh, I was uh, an intern and an apprentice at the National Film Board of Canada. And I apprenticed to a, a picture and sound editor. And my job was to sit next to him while he cut on a Steenbeck, track by track, cut it, find a piece, hand it to me. I'd cut it into the track and make a cue sheet. And I sat and watched. And during the course of that, I became, I saw the potential. You know, I remember, uh, one in particular, there was a documentary on humpback whales. And the crew had been going out and shooting. Um, they were on boats, tracing the whales. And one day, the whales decided to have some fun and flipped the boat, and all the gear and the guys went overboard. And so after that, having lost a Nagra, a camera, and a bunch of other stuff, a very expensive um, slip into the water, um, they continued filming, but then with telephoto lenses and very little sound. And I watched this man, um, uh, now past uh, Les Holman, um, who was an incredible editor, sit with a water lap from the 1000 uh, Sound Ideas 1000 series, I know exactly the track still, and lovingly and painstakingly cut each and every lap up against the body of the whale as it moved and created the illusion that they had been, the mic had been that close. And it was in that moment I, I realized the potential and the magic that, and in fact that, that documentary won for best sound because of that and, not, and, and it was, there was no production sound, it was completely created. And created, by the way, on a steam back with mag, which was extraordinary compared to the tools we have today. Um, and after that, I started to pursue it. I, I made art personally. I was making films and videos, and but always with this very intense sound design. My dad was also an electronic engineer, and his specialty was microwave and radio frequency. And he was always building TVs and things at home, and I would sit and pretend that I was helping him and watching him test stuff on oscilloscopes all the time. So you'd hear sweeps and stuff. And so something was left to me. I certainly had um, what I did develop from that was an absolute fearlessness with technology and a, and a, and a playfulness. And you know, he was building our color TV sets from Heath kits and stuff like that. And I loved that part too. So I have, during my whole career, been equal parts tech and artist and have always built my own studios, which has been very cool for me, um, which has allowed me to now live in the desert alone with no tech support anywhere because it's my, and nobody could really help me because it's very idiosyncratic to how I work. The reason why I think sound is, is you know, we live in a very visually dominant world and, and a very sonically illiterate one also. Um, People are very tuned to music, but like I always laugh when people are, hey, I'm gonna go out and get into nature, I'm gonna enjoy nature, and then they put on a pair of headphones and blast some music and walk you know, in the mountains. And it's crazy to me because people are very unaware sonically of absolutely how much information they're taking in every moment of every day. Um, and so that's kind of interesting because the viscerality of sound, the power of sound, I mean, I can literally shake you, I can make you grab your ears in pain. You know, there's no other medium like it. It's a fantastic medium, but still to this day in 2018 remains almost, you know, a mysterious art form, a, ma a magical art form because people are very, very unaware. I think now it's slightly changing. People are starting to kind of look and listen a little bit more. But I, I feel like there's so much uh, attention to, to visuals that even, I mean, nobody has vocabulary to speak about sound. They use visual words to speak about sound, 
which becomes very tricky working with directors and stuff who have no vocabulary. You've got to really listen to what they're saying and interpret and sometimes figure out based on just the words they've chosen what they actually mean when they describe a sound that they have in their head that is part of their inner world. So it's a, it's a fascinating thing. I, I'm hoping, especially with places like this and you have students coming and, and all this stuff that, that people are becoming more aware of it, but it's, it's funny how long it's taken, you know? And it may be because movies started silent, I don't know. But um, uh, I'm excited to see, I think the next, we're on the brink of a lot of change in the sound world, I think it's gonna be a very exciting next few years because there is with VR in particular, now starting to feel, um, you know, creating these worlds, um, you know, people are starting to realize how important sound and the viscerality and the texturing of sound is to complete the vision, you know, to complete that experience. Well, sound design and sound effects and Foley, they're all very interconnected. Um, they're all part of the same world. Music is another beast, and it's very tricky. And, and I always say the ultimate battle of fire and ice is between music and sound, you know? Because we occupy the same field, we occupy the same territory, you know, it's all sonic. And they have to live together. And, and unfortunately, in a battle of sound and music, usually sound loses um, music, because again, People are more comfortable with music. People are more comfortable with the kind of emotive characters of music and, and overlook the possibilities for emotive expression through sound. Um, so what that means is that um, what sound designers learn as you know, they go through the process of having their music, their sound design obliterated by a music cue that is strong, uh, you learn um, survival tactics if you want your work to be heard and part of that is choosing different frequencies a range of frequencies so if if because if you put all your sonic design for instance in the and the lower frequency range and you got a big thumping or you know low end music because everybody likes the low end um, the music will steamroll the sound and it's gone and also because we have so many formats, remember, I mean, we have a show like Game of Thrones, for instance, which is constantly being downloaded and played on iPads and iPhones and headphones and whatever, and, and rarely even seen in a theater, although sometimes, right? Um, in order for your story that you're telling with sound to live in those less than lovely, favorable audio formats, you have to, um, come up with um, a design that lives in a number of frequency ranges that will live on depending whatever, you know, whatever else happens um, with music or dialogue or whatever. Um, so it's, it's something that only experience really will teach you as you work more and more with, you know, the integration of all the elements, but it's a very important one to learn. And, and again, I think sometimes people give up, you know, it's like they come up with some groovy sound design that's all low end and the music comes in and it's gone. Or it's a low end sound design and then it's played on YouTube and you don't hear any of it. Um, you know, textures are great. You know, if music is smooth, long tones, you know, one of the tricks I use is I will take and flutter my sound through so it's got some movement and it, and it, it, it will, you'll notice it because it's not, you know, if it's just a straight tone and the music's a straight tone, you know, it, the chances of your sound being phased out is pretty high, but if it's got movement to it somehow, either, you know, it can be very subtle, but it, it's very, very effective to help create a space for the sound to live next door to the music, essentially.